Welcome to our session on designing social innovation. I'm Lisa, and I usually introduce myself as someone who's working at the intersection of people, business, and technology, which is basically what design thinking actually is. So it's a perfect introduction for today. If you want to know more about me, you can just Google me. And other than that, what maybe is important for you, that I'm approaching the topic of design thinking, and you will find a lot of different approaches. You will find a different, lot of different methodologies but I'm approaching it as someone who has a background in the empirical social and behavioral sciences and who really has integrated design into her work. So disclaimer, I'm not a full-fledged designer, but really someone who's working at the intersection, but you are going to see that this is what design thinking basically is all about. And before we dive into the topic, I actually have the first question for you, and that is, what is social innovation? Because we heard the term all the time, But what actually is it? What comes to your mind when you hear about social innovation? What is it? I really like your results because they refer to a lot of values and a lot. We're going to see what this is all about, basically. A lot of collaboration, about user-centeredness, about human-centeredness, and also really a lot about inclusivity. And the one term that I also mentioned is progress, because for me, innovation always has to do with change and progress. In traditional innovation management, I won't go too deep into that, but I find it actually quite helpful. In traditional innovation management, you often have different types of innovation. And you will, this is a short taxonomy, it's not exhaustive, but you will often hear about product, service, and process innovation. And actually, I find that social innovation can be all of this. It can be a new product that is introduced. It can be a new service that is introduced, for instance, mentoring or consulting services. But it can also be process innovation if you're, for instance, introducing agile frameworks. And one important distinction is also the degree of innovation that you can really distinguish between incremental or disruptive innovation. And you hear the term disruptive innovation a lot when, for instance, it's not a social innovation necessarily, but when it comes to the um, Apple iPhone, for instance, this would be some sort of disruptive innovation because they really built something that was based on needs that they created with the iPhone. And with design think thinking, we're going to see why this is the case. We often have incremental innovation. That is, we have gradual, continuous improvement. It's a bit based on how the design thinking process works. But we're not necessarily talking about disruptive innovation here, but really about gradual, continuous innovation. And there are a lot of definitions of what social innovation is. One that I personally like, because it's not too abstract, is that social innovation is the process of developing and deploying effective solutions to challenging and often systematic social and environmental issues in support of social progress. So see, you also have the word progress here. And what's also important about this definition or why I chose it is that they already mentioned the systemic, social and env environmental issues here. And this is actually really important because when we're dealing with social innovations or when we're dealing with societal challenges, we are dealing with so-called wicked problems. You might have heard the terms before. It was originally coined by two design theorists and the paper by Horst Rittel and his colleague, whose name I forgot, in 1973. And they coined the term and they defined 10 characteristics of wicked problems. And you can also click on the link icon to access the original paper. And what's so special about wicked problems is, and societal challenges are wicked problems, that they are really hard to define because they are highly complex, they are systemic, and the requirements to basically solve the problem, they are dynamic, they are interconnected, and it's also hard to design a solution because there is no single or simple solution. So you cannot approach it in terms of right and wrong because what is the right version or the right solution to, for instance, social inequality? But you really have to approach it in terms of better or worse or worse in those degrees and not in terms of right or wrong, yes or no, true or false. And there is also no definitive solution. That means it's unclear when the problem is actually successfully solved because there is no stopping rule. Because again, when is the point where you, where you really solve successfully, for instance, a problem like the corona pandemic or social inequality or also digital transformation? And it's really hard to say, okay, now we solve digital transformation. When is this going to happen? And I encountered a tweet that I really liked, even though it's on Twitter and it's not necessarily a peer-reviewed publication, but someone wrote basically every problem where there are a lot of stakeholders involved or groups of stakeholders with different interests and you need alignment and you basically need to change their mindset. This or these problems are wicked problems. 
And I really like it because it really highlights the human dimension. And luckily we have a tool to solve these problems. It's not the only tool. You maybe all already have heard of open social innovation like hashtag via versus virus. This would also be a problem solving approach. But we're dealing in the session with design thinking. And what's really important about design thinking is when you heard the term design, it's not necessarily about, for instance, designing a graphic. So it's not really graphic design. It's not necessarily user interface design. This can be the result of the design thinking process. But design thinking really is a way, and the term thinking already explains it, of seeing the world and of approaching problems, of solving problems. And this is a definition that I personally like. It's by Tim Brown, and he's the executive chair of IDEO. And IDEO is a really well-known design firm, and they basically popularize the concept of design thinking, similar to the um, D School by Stanford's D School, or in Germany, the Hasso Plattner Institute is really well known for design thinking. And he mentions that design thinking is a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from designers' toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. And really, design thinking lies at this intersection of people, of technology, and of business. And one important aspect of design thinking is it can be both a mindset and it can also be a methodology. And the mindset is already included in the first sentence where it says design thinking is a human-centered approach. So what is human-centered approach? Humanity-centered design or human-centered design, and this is the term that is coined by John Norman. He, he's something like the godfather of design, and his blog post upon which this slide is based is also linked, if you click on the link icon, and it has five characteristics. So the first one is that it's people-centered. So the most important part of human-centered design, and also similar to user-centered design, where you focus on the users of your product or of your service, is that it's really focused on the people. And not only on the people, but on the whole ecosystem of people where they are embedded in and their needs. And it's also important to understand and solve the right problem. So it's often the case that we try to fix problems, which are actually all, all, also, maybe also solutions, yes, are also symptoms, but they are not necessarily the root causes. And one approach here is to ask the five whys. If you, for instance, came up with a project and nobody's contributing to, you would ask, okay, why is nobody contributing to it? And maybe they didn't know about it. So you would again ask, why didn't they know about it? Maybe you didn't promote it. So why didn't you promote it? And so on, you, you get it, how it works. And the five whys, it's not necessarily that you ask five times why. It could also be six times, it can be three times. But the idea is really to ask why and to find the root causes to solve them instead of fixing symptoms. And another important aspect also from system thinking or what systems thinking is also, is that everything is interconnected. The people are embedded in the environment, in the context, in the culture, in everything. And it's really important to adopt a long-term systems perspective on it. And it's of course, also important to develop really small and simple interventions, because as we've seen before, you cannot solve the problem all at once. And so the, yeah, the, in a way, the logical solution to that or the logical approach would be to really develop small and simple interventions and really continuously test them and refine your proposed solutions. And you might know this from agile or lean approaches. And it works in the same principle. And the last point is also really important, and that is to co-design with the community. And some of you already mentioned it, that it's a lot about collaboration and really enabling and serving as a facilitator and not designing for people and just developing your solutions, but really co-design with the people, ask them about their problems, design with them, not for them. And the last point is what really makes this humanity-centered design, whereas the first four points, they are also well-known in human-centered design or in user-centered design. And now that we've covered what design thinking as some sort of way of thinking or philosophy is, this is design thinking as a methodology. And disclaimer here, you will find different approaches, different processes with three steps. I've seen design thinking with six steps. I just like to present the one with five steps because it's just what I learned. And this is also what Stanford's D School uses. And design thinking as a process or as a methodology consists of five steps. It's not linear. So I try to wiggle it a bit around those different, how would I say it, those different bubbles in that way. And the first one is really to start with empathizing, 
with people. It means before you can solve a problem, you really need to understand which problem to solve. You to really understand people's needs and get a feeling for their problems. After you really understood people, you can then define the problem that you want to solve. And the goal really is here to create some sort of guiding vision that can guide your ideation process. So after you understood people and you defined the problem that you solve, you can really think about solutions. And here, usually it's that quality is better than quantity, but here it's really quantity is better than quality. And it's really about generating as much solutions to the problem you defined before that you can think of. And they don't necessarily need to be great solutions. It's really about coming up with solutions as many as possible and as out of the box as possible. And then after you collected all those solutions, then you can judge the solutions, whether they are viable or not. Really the first steps here really to ideate broadly. And once you ideated solutions and maybe you selected the solutions that you find or like best or that people like best, you can really build a prototype. And a prototype can be anything. It can be a user interface. It can be a simple sketch. It can really be low cost and low effort. For instance, I once developed a prototype of a chair, which basically is also just an origami chair. This is also a prototype. The important part is that you can really hand it over to people so that they can interact with and you can get their feedback on the prototype solutions. And the last part is, I already mentioned it, you build the prototype because you want some sort of feedback. So you want to hand the prototype over to people, the people that you are designing with, and really collect their feedback and learn quickly and iterate and improve both your prototype and the solution. So as you can see, and what I really like about design thinking, it's neither rocket science nor is it easy. It's not a linear process, but basically what is all it is all about is you really try to understand the problem that you're solving by interacting or engaging with people, then you're defining the problem, then you're ideating solutions based on the definitions of the problem, and then you're building prototypes of your proposed solutions, and then you really collect feedback. And then maybe you either the solution or the prototype works or not, and then you go back. But important is that it's not a linear process. And now this is, might sound or is actually pretty abstract. So I thought of a small case study that we can go through together, at least the first three steps, because we won't, will not be able to build prototypes in the session. But this is just a small case study. I already teased it online. And it's a simple scenario. Imagine the scenario. You're collaborating with New Future, a nonprofit that wants to get ready for the digital age. And until recently, New Future's core team largely relied on traditional frameworks and tools. And now it's up to you, a human-centered designer, to help the team navigate New Future's digital transformation. So basically, we're a human-centered designer, and New Future, and this is just a made-up organization, they don't really exist. They want to get ready for the digital age because up to now, it's really traditional and it's no longer up to date. And they are asking us for help. So... This, as we already established before, is a wicked problem. It's not really clear when did the transformation happen, when it's successful, when it's over, basically. But what we can do, we can apply design thinking. So what we're going to do now is we're going to the first three steps. That is, we're empathizing with people. Then we're defining the problem because just helping them navigate a digital transformation is too broad to really ideate solutions. And then we will really break it down to, into manageable chunks, I'd say, so that we can then, after we have defined our challenges or our problems, then we can really ideate solutions and try whether we can help new future. And the first part is, and I already mentioned it multiple times, is really to empathize with people. And the goal here is to understand the problem we're trying to solve by observing, engaging, and empathizing with people. My question to you would be, how are we going to do this? Would you just talk to them or maybe would you document your results? I'd say the most common way to empathize with people is really to interview people. And usually you would go with unstructured interviews. That is, you would really try to go into the interview as open-minded as possible. There's, but there's also the possibility to structure it. For instance, with the anonymous poll, you would actually write your questions down and really ask the questions. But ideally, the really first part is to go into the interview and have it as unstructured as possible because you don't want to restrict the people. Because if you word your questions a certain way, you have your assumptions and you would really go 
into the broad field and basically do ground research. But there's also the possibility to just observe them. Because for instance, for one design challenge, I had to go to a supermarket and to see how we can redesign the supermarket based on the restrictions of the COVID pandemic. So I actually went into a supermarket and just had a look at what people are buying and whether it makes sense to restructure it, whether some products are more important than others. Or you can also take pictures. You can, of course, always with consent. Um, you can film them. You can draw sketches. You can write notes. So it's really whatever helps you empathize and understand people and really engage with people. Everything is fine. The next part of, based on our research from the very first part, is to actually define the problem. And this, I'd say, together with the empathize part, is the most important part because your solutions will depend on the problem you're defining. And the goal of the defined phase is really to synthesize the findings and leverage insights to reframe the core problems in human-centric ways. And here's also an important distinction included, and this is the one between findings and insights. And usually what people mean when they refer to, or people as in designers, mean when they refer to findings, it's really about what people do. So for instance, you observe them doing something at work. And insight is really this sort of aha moment when you understand why they are doing it. So this is an important distinction that you will find in design research. And the goal really is here to create, as I mentioned before, some sort of guiding vision, the problem statement, so that you can really ideate solutions based on this statement. And the idea here is also to refine the core problems in human-centered ways and really make this transition from problem orientation to solution orientation. And you will see it's pretty easy. It's just based on wording. And what you can do here, and I will present you some tools. And what's important here, it's intentionally abstract because it's not necessarily about the content that you will now see on or with that the tools are filled with, so to say, but really about the tools themselves. And one important tool that you will often or basically always find in design thinking is so-called persona. And here we have a really brief persona of someone who's called Natalia, who's an impact manager at New Future, who's 33. And we also have a picture of her. And we have a quote that says, I'm responsible for coordinating our impact activities and I need to keep an eye on our data. And what's really important here is that at New Future, there is actually no one called Natalia, who's an impact manager and who's 33, because the idea here is really to synthesize your insights and your research, basically, that you gathered from the very first step. So a persona is a fictitious character and it really helps you. The goal here is to understand people and to make it more vivid, because of course you can have an Excel file and you have data in it, but it doesn't really help you to gain empathy and to really empathize with the people. So this is why you create fictitious people or artificial people based on your actual research to really in some sort of represent different types of people that you're interacting with. And what you can also do to even gain more understanding is to create, for instance, an empathy map. This is another tool. And this would also be based on the research, on the notes you took, on the videos you filmed, on the audio files that you also recorded, whatever you did in the very first step. And here we have also Natalia. And you go more into detail what she says, what she does, what she thinks, and also what she feels. And maybe she actually said some of those phrases or keywords, or you really merged what multiple people said into this persona. And maybe she said, I'm not sure if everyone is ready for change or this feels slightly chaotic. Or maybe she realized that there was a digital skills gap within the team. And what she does is Natalia, as the impact manager, as we've seen before, she coordinates people. This can be colleagues, this can be partners. And she sits a lot of meetings and she also relies on spreadsheets and emails because she has to keep an eye on the data as we've seen before. And maybe what she's saying is, and this is a bit of a difference to the other ones, this is the what people are thinking is to a degree always based on assumptions so it's really about what you think what they think and maybe she thinks or you think that they think that this is too much information and that she's wasting time in meetings and how can we actually digitalize our impact and the last part is and here it's also more about what she feels and really some sort of explanation for her behavior and this is what you realize both with the personas and the empathy map, it's not about demographics as in marketing. It's really about behavior and how people feel and about how they act. So to really understand people and not only have the numbers. And maybe she feels accountable for the whole process. 
maybe she feels overwhelmed and unsure of whether it will all work out. But definitely she's excited and hopeful because she sees the potential of digitization. And this helps us to structure our research and to really the next step here, if we have all the sort of, there are a lot of, a lot of, <laughs> lot of tools and some people rely on, mostly on personas, some people rely on empathy maps, some people combine it and they also integrate other tools. But a really important point here is that we now have our research lined out in a way that we can really empathize with our persona Natalia. And now the goal is to find out what the actual problems are, because this would not help us really to define the problems because it's way too unstructured. And one way is to define problem statements or so-called pain points. And the way I designed it, there are at least three pain points that I would see based on what she mentioned, what she thinks, what she feels and what she does. And these are that some team members resist organizational change because maybe they fear it. Another pain point would be that managers such as Natalia, they might miss relevant inf information due to inefficient processes and outdated tools because she sits a lot in meetings and at just too, too many meetings and too many information to really guide her decision-making. And another point is that she mentioned with regard to the digital skills gap that some team members might lack digital skills to create impact in the digital world. And there are definitely a lot of other pain points. These are just the three most important ones that I sort of hit in the empathy map when I designed it. And what's important here that it's not a takeaway in the sense that this is what digital transformation is about. These are the usual pain points. I would say that I designed it based on my experiences, what are maybe some pain points that frequently occur based on my experiences, but it's really about the tool and the method here and not so much about the content. And as you can see here now, we started with the first problem that we had or the, the overview of the challenge that we need to help them with a digital transformation. And now we're at a point where we have three pain points or three challenges. It means the resistance to organiza organizational change, that maybe the structures are a bit inefficient and maybe the team members lack digital skills. So it's a lot more concrete than when we started, just based on our empathizing with people and really defining the problems. But as you can see, it's still a bit, I don't want to say negative, but it's really problem oriented. And what we want to do next is really to reframe it in a sort of way that it's really more about the solution and less about the problem. And there are one simple tool for it, and it's the so-called how might we questions. And the wording already says the how refers to, okay, we have to idea it broadly. And the same thing is reflected in the might. The solution that we came up with, it might not be the one single solution because it maybe is a good solution, but we don't know. And also the we, because it refers to the collaborative effort that a lot of you mentioned in the beginning when it was about social innovation and what social innovation is. And here you can see based on the three pain points that we defined. So the resistance to organization change, inefficient processes, and the lack of digital skills. They are also here. The content in itself is the same, but it's really a different wording. And now we're asking because we're more interested in the solutions. So how might we inspire team members to embrace change? Or how might we support the team's current processes with digital tools and methods? Or how might we upskill team members to create impact in the digital age? And you can see now we have really a three very concrete or to, to a different degree concrete questions that can guide our ideation process. And now we know, okay, how might we approach this challenge that we defined? And because three challenges are actually quite a lot, I would like to focus and prioritize the very first one. So the how might we inspire team members to embrace change? Because change basically is at the heart of digital transformation. It's at the heart of social innovation. It's the heart of progress. So I'd really like us to focus on how might we inspire team members to embrace change? And this is actually what we're going to do together. And in the next phase, the ideation phase, and the goal really here is to generate ideas, to find solutions to the core problems we just identified. And as I mentioned before, I'd like to focus on the how might we inspire the team to embrace change question. And I would ask you again to go to menti.com. And it's really not about whether it's the best solution in the world. It's really about 
the quality of solutions. So how might we inspire the team to embrace change? It can be in that way totally stupid. It doesn't matter at this point. It's really just about creativity and coming up with as many potential solutions as possible. So what good things the change brings with it. Storytelling drives the vision with good examples. Show how efficient the current, inefficient the current work environment is. True. By starting small, by starting small by introducing one new digital tool to a team meeting, asking others to present their ideas. Include them in the process. I love this because this really is design thinking on a meta level that we just basically inspire the team by including them in the process, what design thinking is all about. Ask for personal development. This is also change forward. We could also combine solutions and really idea broadly or maybe create new formats with the people that we're basically designing for or really have, as you're writing here, asking others to present their ideas. Just or be a positive example, because I really like this. And same with the including them in the process, because it's something we can actually do, every single one of us can actually do. And it doesn't take much. We don't need to create a new format. We don't need to really design something. We can just try to be the change. And the last one that I would really, really read out, help them find a solution to one of the individual problems and pain points and make it more individual. That's also a good one. Yes, to all of your solutions, of course. And what we could just do next is really try to, or one way to approach it, or that I like to approach it, is to use some sort of affinity mapping approach that you can really cluster similar solutions. And then maybe once you cluster similar solutions, you can just use dot voting, for instance. So every single participant of the design thinking process, they get, for instance, three dots and they can vote on the solutions they like best just in a way to select the best solutions that are liked by everyone. Once we fund this, we would just select the solutions that we find that we, as, as a team, basically, that we like best, and we just design and build interactive prototypes. For instance, we could sketch our ideas and show, okay, this is how it would look like. Or we can, just as I showed before, we can create some chair in, in a more abstract way to really design, for instance, I don't know if we're wanting to come up with a new workshop format and we could just try to really make a prototype of it. Or if it's about a user interface or an app, we could just do, do a wireframe, for instance, or a mock-up. And it's really, as I mentioned before, it's really low effort. It's just low cost and it can be anything. It can be as small as sort of this image that is presented here or really, yeah, the chair or even just a sketch or anything that people can interact with and that you can really communicate your ideas with. And once you've done this, we're already in the last phase. And this is really collecting timely feedback on the prototype solution to learn and iterate. And this is what it's all about. It's not about creating fancy, high cost, high profile prototypes or anything. It's really about getting feedback as early and as often as possible. And here, the important part is that we can test and refine our problem statements and really ask ourselves, did we frame the problem correctly? Maybe the problem with digital transformation or whatever we're trying to solve is something else. We can learn more about the people who are affected. So did we really understand the pain points and needs? Maybe we missed something that we don't have on our list. We can also improve our prototypes and solutions to really see whether we get the solution right. I mean, we, of course, know with wicked problems, we don't have a right solution, but we can at least try to make it better and hope that it's not worse. And this is what really the feedback phase is all about. And as I mentioned before, design thinking is not rocket science. It's really about understanding people and really defining the problem, creating solutions based on the problems we defined and build something that people can interact with and collect timely feedback on it. And if you want to learn more about design thinking, what I personally can highly recommend is the free resources list by the Interaction Design Foundations. There are also paid courses, but they also have a lot of free resources that are really in multiple slides. I actually link their resources because I like them best. And there are also two books that I linked. One book I actually do have here. It's called Lean Impact by N. May Chang, and it's based on the Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And she also touches things like Agile and Lean and design thinking. And I highly, highly recommend her book because she directly applies it to social innovation. So it's a really good book with a lot of examples. And my, 
my last slide now is before we head into the discussion and if you have questions, you can of course ask them, is some sort of best practices. And basically the whole session was, was about thinking like a designer. And it means focus on your people and their specific needs. It's not necessarily that you have to be an expert, not on the people and not on some discipline, but it's really about bringing people together. And it's important to build a diverse multidisciplinary team so that everyone can contribute. Because if you only have people from, for instance, business, with a business background, your solutions will be business oriented because other perspectives aren't there. And it's really important when you're designing to really bring in as many people as possible and to bring, break down silos. And it's also beware of overgeneralizing problems and solutions, what a lot of people do, especially I have a consulting background in parts. And yes, it's a great solution, but it might not work for every company or every organization. And it's really important. People matter, culture matters, history matters, environments matters. So in short, context matters. And one important part that I see in a lot of, especially when it comes to technology, is that people really build their solutions because they find it interesting and because they think they can help. This might actually be true, but the most important part here is, and that's what I mean when I say design with, not for people, is the important part and the role of the designer is to really empower people to solve their own problems. Do not solve the problems for them. Really act as a facilitator and implement community-led solutions because this builds alignment and shared interest and shared understanding. And it also increases people's agency and it will increase the acceptance and adoption rates of the solution. Trust me. And the last point is, and for me, this is really what, what not only design thinking, but also agile and lean approaches are about, is to embrace, and you might have heard of this acronym, VUCA, which means volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So it's really about embracing change and embracing not knowing and knowing that you cannot solve the problem all at once. And also really to welcome failure because you will fail. And this is the idea behind also agile, also lean, and also design thinking. It's not having it perfect, but really trying to value progress over this perfection and really make mistakes and learn from them. And how do you do it? By engaging with people, by building something, by testing it, and by learning from it. And then you go back to the very first step and you do it all over again.